Ahoy there! Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another episode of Capital Games, the mini-series where I teach you everything you need to know about getting started with the new capital ships in EVE Echoes. Kind of like the Catskull Academy, but absolutely not for beginners. I'm assuming, by the way, that you already understand things like turret and missile mechanics, how drone ship works, um, and basically how fitting and most of the ship statistics work. These are, of course, not beginner-friendly ships. You need to be Tech 10 alone to fly them, and they are incredibly skill point intensive. I do not recommend even considering flying a capital ship if you are fairly new to EVE Echoes. Build up your knowledge on other smaller ships first and then consider these as a very late game content shift. Now in today's video we're going to be talking about carriers. We've covered dreadnoughts already elsewhere and we're going to be looking at everything you need to know from examining the individual uh, ships themselves and what their stats all mean to talking about the exclusive carrier modules, how the skills affect them and things like how fighter squadrons work. This is also a pretty special video for me because I've been given a whole bunch of discount codes by NetEase to help celebrate the Interstellar Bazaar Neon Rain event. So I've got 10 50% off discount codes, 20 30% off discount codes, and a whopping 200 10% discount codes. Now the 30% and the 10% discount codes can be earned by finding me on Twitter and the Catskull Academy Discord, both of which are linked in the description of this video. The 10 50% discount codes, however, will be earned by watching this video. You're in for a chance of winning those. Stay tuned to this video, I'll explain how you can enter for that later on. Otherwise though, make sure you hit like on the video, subscribe to the channel and ding that notification bell to never miss a video. Otherwise, let's get going talking about carriers. Capital ships are the largest tonnage of vessel available in EVE Echoes, and carriers are one of the types of capital ships currently available. There's a carrier for each of the four main empires. The Amar Empire have the Archon, the Kaldari State have the Chimera, the Galente Federation have the Thanatos, and the Minmatar Republic have the Nidhogger. And that's what we're going to be looking at here to sort of set things off, but we will have a brief look at the other three for comparisons later on. Now if we have a look at the attributes and fittings of a carrier, the first thing you should notice is that they have a very unique fitting profile. They first of all have three drone tubes, except they're not actually drone tubes. This time around these are fighter bays. They're kind of like drone tubes, but they can only launch fighter squadrons. You cannot launch small, medium, large or sentry drones out of these only fighter squadrons. And equally, fighter squadrons can only be launched out of fighter bays on a carrier. You should then notice that we do not have any high slots available on a carrier. Our damage output comes entirely from the fighter squadrons. It's not like, say, the Vexer or the Dominics, where you can also get different high slots like missiles or railguns that are going to assist with your damage. These are purely from the fighter squadrons. We do, however, have a massive five mid slots and eight low slots. We then have three each of the combat rigs and engineering rigs. You'll notice, however, that capital rigs do have a special rule on them that says capital license one. Those rigs can only be fit to capital ships. Anyway, as we come further, despite the fact that the name Carrier, their cargo hold capacity is actually fairly small. You can see here the Nidhogger only has 860 cubic meters. Defensively as well, they look very high on the defense compared to other ships that we may have seen before. We've got nearly half a million EHP here on the Nidhogger. However, that is a lot smaller than the survivability of something like a Dreadnought. For capital ships, carriers are fairly squishy, but note that I say for capital ships. Overall, these are still very sturdy vessels. They also have very large capacitor banks, they can lock onto up to 8 targets, and they have an incredibly large signature radius. Here you can see the Nidhogger, which is the smallest of the four carriers in regards to its signature radius, is 7,305.9 meters. Now the scan resolution lies to you a little bit. Here you can see a 75mm scan resolution which looks atrocious, but all of the carriers have a special activatable mode that will stop them warping, but give them 500% increase to scan resolution, which actually pushes this up well over 500mm, making it actually ridiculously quick to lock on if you want it to. 
We do have a very slow flight velocity, 107 me meters per second. Again, this is the fastest of the four carriers, with a warp speed of 1.5 astronomical units per second. An incredibly high mass and a low inertia modifier means that this is a surprisingly clunky, slow to align ship, which is what you'd expect. It's also got a jump drive, we talked about this in the Dreadnought video and I have done a Cat Skull Academy video exclusively on how sinus Ural fields and jump drives work, so if you're interested to know more about those, check that out. Then when we look at the trait descriptions, the different stat bonuses that the various carriers can get. First of all, it's worth noting that every carrier has bonuses from Light, Fighter, Operation, and Carrier Command. We'll talk more about those skills explicitly later on, but know that every character benefits from those two skills. We then have a roll bonus which is shared across all four carriers as well. A 400% increase to Entosis Link activation time means these are not good ships to put an Entosis Link on. If you've watched my Cat Skull Academy on how Entosis Link modules work, you'll know that basically you need a full activation cycle to steal whichever Citadel it is you're trying to link. And so if the activation time is 400% longer, that's 400% longer that you have to wait without being interrupted. We then have the jump drive being available on the Nidhogger, allowing us to jump across multiple systems without using stargates, and we can fit command bursts. It's also worth noting that the command burst modules have an additional 100% effective range to them, a par for the course for all of the carriers. Moving on to the skills then, first of all we have Light Fighter Operation. In the case of the Nidhogger this increases Light Fighter damage by 5%, 25% damage overall, and then Carrier Command is going to increase that by a further 5% on the flight velocity. So here on the Nidhogger, having both those skills trained up is going to give you 25% uh, faster flying uh, Light Fighters, and they're going to do 25% additional damage as well. Now on top of this, you'll notice we have Shield Command Burst bonuses here on the Nidhogger from Carrier Command, and that's going to be the same across the board for the others. Obviously, the uh, the Kaldari Chimera is going to get Shield Command Burst, whereas the Archon and the Thanatos will both get Armored Command Bursts. Let's actually have a look at these by comparison. So let's move first of all then across to the Kaldari State and the Chimera. And here you can see we've got that same roll bonus, but here Light Fighter instead of 5% damage is 5% Fighter Explosion Velocity, which is basically how they apply their damage to a target. So you won't deal as much damage, but you can deal it better to smaller targets. Carrier Command, in addition to giving Shield Command Burst bonuses, um, has a 4% Shield Resistance. So this makes the Chimera a little bit more tanky than the Nidhogger otherwise might be. If we then look at the Galente Thanatos, this is similar to the Nidhogger in that its main light fighter operation is again 5% light fighter damage, but Carrier Command, instead of giving us additional speed on the fighters, gives us additional light fighter EHP, makes them tankier, harder to kill. We then swap the Shield Command Burst for Armoured Command Bursts here on the Thanatos. Finally then, on the subject of Armoured Command Bursts, we move across to the Amar Empire for the Archon. And the Archon, again, we now have Light Fighter Optimal Range, a 5% increase for Light Fighter Operation, um, meaning that they can apply their damage a bit better. The Armored Command Burst remains here like the Thanatos, but we swap out the, uh, the, the Fighter stats for additional Armor Resistance, 20% Armor Resistance at full training there, making it that little bit more tanky. Let's talk then about skills that are relevant to a carrier. Now, obviously I'm doing this on the Fulmination Content Creator Test Server, which is why all of my skills are at 555, and why I still have 45 million skill points spare, which is just crazy, wouldn't you love that on live? Anyway, so of course, cruising technology is going to be our first stop, and as you might have guessed from the fact that we've seen Carrier Command already as one of the bonuses on the different carriers, there is a Carrier Command skill. Now the skill itself doesn't really do all that much. 35% inertia modifier and 20% increase to flight velocity sounds pretty nice, but let's be fair, these are still not fast ships, and even with this fully trained, they are ridiculously cumbersome. That said, it is a skill you're going to want to train because every single one of the carriers does benefit from it. You're getting additional bonuses to armored command burst or shield command burst, along with things like additional drone flight velocity, drone EHP, uh, shield resistance or armor resistance, depending on which of the carriers we're talking about. So absolutely, Carrier Command is probably the first skill you want to train all the way to five if you're uh, flying carriers. 
The second one is, of course, under drones. If we scroll past all the relative drone skills, we come to light fighter operation. Again, this wants to be trained all the way to five so that you get the full hull bonuses from whichever carrier you're flying, whether that's the additional 5% damage per level for the Nidhogger or the Thanatos, whether it's 5% explosion velocity for the Chimera, or whether it's 5% uh, of the optimal range for the Archon. You'll want to train this skill up to 5 right away in order to benefit from that. In addition though, it's a really nice skill to have anyway because it's 20% additional light fighter damage and a 10% reduction to light fighter explosion radius. And if you're getting hints of missiles, well, we'll talk about how light fighters actually operate later on. Let's just say that for now, you want to train light fighter operation to 5 and carry a command to 5 straight away before you even consider any of the other skills. Now, of course, while we're looking at weapons, though, there is still Light Fighter Upgrade, which is probably going to be your next stop after getting Carrier Command and Light Fighter Operation. This again increases the damage of your Light Fighters, whilst also increasing their accuracy falloff and their optimal range, allowing them to hit targets from a little bit further away, which allows them to start applying their damage sooner, and it means they apply more accurately against moving targets in a fight, which, of course, most things are going to be. Now, most of this should seem fairly familiar if you've ever piloted drone ships, but it's worth noting that whereas drones have, for example, medium drone operation and medium drone upgrade, you then have the drone skill, there is no fighter skill. You'll see we go straight from drone here to light fighter operation, light fighter upgrade, and that's it. So those are the only weapon skills you need to worry about here when flying a carrier. And remember, carriers don't have high slots either, so you don't need to worry about capital high slot skills. Anyway, so now that we've trained Carrier Command to 5 and we've started on light, uh, light Fighter Operation and Light Fighter Upgrade, where would you go from there? What other skills might be worth your attention? Now, I'm not saying these in any particular order other than the order they appear in in the skill tree. First of all, under cruising technology, if we come all the way down, we have the jump drive operation skill. Now, if you're going to be using carriers, chances are you're going to be using jump drives and sinusural fields to get around a lot. So wouldn't it be nice to have additional range on how far you can jump, reduce the amount of fuel required to make those jumps, and be able to do so with less capacitor than 95%? Well, that's basically what the jump drive operation skill does. Training into this will make it so that your jump drive is far more efficient, you can go further, and it's going to cost you less in order to do so. In terms of defences, this is a key point with carriers that I'm already seeing a lot of people make this mistake. It doesn't Carriers do not care if you have full skills in shield operation or armour operation. Those only affect small, medium and large shield boosters, small, medium and large armour repairers. Now if you scroll beyond these, there is the capital shield operation skill, and indeed the capital armour operation skill. Now, the capital shield operation um, reduces the amount of activation time on a shield booster by 10%, and it reduces the capacitor need by 10%. You'll notice that capital armor operation reduces the armor repairer activation time and capacitor need by 15%. Now, I've had a lot of people message me already saying, hey, Benzie, I've noticed that armor repairers, capital armor repairers, just aren't as good as shield boosters. And certainly there was a dev Q&A on this as well. And the reason is that on paper, if you just look at a, shield, a capital shield booster and a capital armor repairer side by side, yes, the shield booster looks better when you math it out. Armor repairers, however, do get considerably bigger bonuses from the skills, and training into the skills is what is going to make those armor repairers uh, much more efficient, uh, lower their capacitor amount whilst increasing their rep speed, um, and actually brings them on par with the shield boosters. Unskilled, the two are, uh, are not equal. Um, it's a little bit confusing that the skills are so different and that you really need armor repairer skills to make them worthwhile, whereas the shield booster skills aren't quite as uh, intensive as the others, but hey, there we go, that's not up to me, maybe NetEase will patch that. Finally then, under maintenance technology at the bottom, there is carrier defense upgrade, which is straight up additional hit points for your carrier, which quite frankly you're going to be shot at a lot in a carrier, having something that makes you even tankier and harder to kill is always going to be a good thing, and I do feel that the defense upgrade skills are probably some of the least represented, and people don't look at them and think that's not particularly exciting, it can make the world of difference. Of course, we then have carrier engineering, vitally important, especially if you're going to be using shield boosters, as uh, so if you're running the Nidhogger or the uh, 
or the Chimera, for example, you're probably going to want to get Carrier Engineering a little bit earlier than if you're running the Archon or the Thanatos. Um, and under targeting, target management is always a nice one to have skilled up as well, just to increase that lock-on speed. 500 millisecond, uh, 500 meter, millimeters is pretty good for a ship. Of, uh, it's blasted good for a ship of this size. Um, but of course, you can pump it up that little bit further with skills if you wanted to. Also, if you're intending to use shield commands or armoured commands, note that you're not going to be as good as a dedicated command ship, but if you are going to be the ship in your fleet that is using those command burst modules, then absolutely it's worth having a look at the shield command and armoured command skills, just to improve their effectiveness. Now, on the subject of things that you're probably going to want to do, I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I've got a whole bunch of discount codes to give you guys for the Interstellar Bazaar Neon Rain. If you're not sure what these are, basically if you come to the store and go to Interstellar Bazaar, I've done a video on this already, but you can have a look at the various different chests and there's the option to use a discount code. Now, I have 10 50% off discount codes to give to you guys, along with 20 30% and 200 10% ones. Again, the 200 10% ones and the 20 30% ones I'm going to distribute via Twitter and Discord, so make sure you're following me on Twitter and that you've joined the Catskull Discord for more information on those, but if you want to be in for the chance of winning one of the 10 50% off vouchers, then please do listen up. I'm going to want a comment from you down in the description below telling me which your favourite capital ship is and why. You might not be flying it, you just might think it's one of the coolest looking. It might be just that it reminds you of something or it's the one that you're looking forward to blowing up the most. If you tell me which carrier you're looking forward to, which capital, sorry, you're looking forward to and why, I will pick 10 of you in 24 hours time to each receive a discount code. So make sure you've got your notifications on as well um, because I will be sending those discount codes preferably via discord so that it's not public in the comment section on youtube but otherwise if you don't have discord don't worry i can do it in the comment section you're just going to be need to i need to be quick now multiple people can win multiple of these codes but each code can only be used once and each item can only have one code applied to it so for example if i would go here i can only enter one discount code i can't put a 50 percent a 30 percent and a 10 percent unfortunately also don't worry about the fact that i've got 985,952 plex there this is not the live server this is fulmination i wish i had that much on live in order to effectively fly a carrier, of course, it is going to be vital that you understand how fighter squadrons work. Now, if you've been using drone ships like, for example, the Vexa, the Arbitrator, or the Dominix, you'll have a vague understanding about how these actually operate in effect, but in regards to their statistics, they do vary quite significantly. Now, of course, I am also assuming that you are familiar with the workings of both how turrets and how missiles work, because th those are both necessary in understanding how well a fighter squadron operates. Now, you'll notice that there are eight different types of fighter squadron. There are two varieties for each of the four empires. So the Knight and the Templar exist for the Amar Empire and deal exclusively electromagnetic damage. The Locust and the Dragonfly are the Kaldari State Fighters, and they deal kinetic damage. The Sator and the Furbolg are the Galente Federation Fighters, dealing exclusively thermal damage. And the Gram and the Ein Heryi are the Minmatar Republic's Fighter Squadron, dealing exclusively explosive damage. And of course, it's those that we're going to look at in regards to their statistics. Now, obviously, there are two different types of Fighter Squadron. You'll see what the difference is momentarily. We're going to start off by having a look at the Ein Heryi here, Mark 9 version of the Ein Heryi. Um, you can see here it's got a DPS of 62.07 and it deals entirely explosive damage. If you're familiar with drones, that should all be pretty obvious. The overall defense is the overall defense of the fighter squadron there, um, along with things like, as we come further down, the flight velocity, the orbital speed and command range should all be fairly familiar to drone pilots. It's worth noting that the command range of fighter squadrons is a whopping 500 kilometers which is an insanely long distance for them to be able to operate at however you may have noticed that in addition just to the usual dps damage and activation time they also have both optimal range and accuracy fall off and explosion velocity and explosion radius things that normally do not go side by side turrets use optimal range and accuracy fall off whereas missiles use explosion velocity and explosion radius now, for the purposes of dealing damage, the uh, fighter squadrons essentially operate using missile physics. They're actually firing sort of, you know, small arms fire, but
but because there's nine of them or however many firing at the same target, it's kind of a radial shotgun approach um, that uses a mix of the turret stats and the missile stats. For applying damage though, understand that explosion velocity, obviously the higher the explosion velocity, the better you can apply damage to faster moving targets. The lower the explosion radius, the better you apply damage to smaller targets. We then have the optimal range and the accuracy fall off. Basically, it means that you apply perfectly at optimal range up to 10 kilometers with the, you know, and the explosion velocity and explosion radius. If you imagine that they're basically missiles with a 10 kilometer range and 100 meters per second, 30, 350 millimeter, uh, 350 meter there, on the application, but then you have the accuracy fall off as well. Like turrets, this means if you go beyond the optimal range by up to one accuracy fall off, you gradually reduce from 100% effectiveness down to 50%, and if you go a further accuracy fall off, that gradually reduces from essentially 50% down to 0%. So these have an effective range of 30 kilometers. You're going to be 100% effective at 10 kilometers, 50% at 20 kilometers, and almost completely ineffective by the time you hit 30. Now, if we have a look then at the other uh, other type of fighter here, the Gram, you'll notice this is significantly lower DPS. It's got lower overall damage of 100 kinetic, but a faster activation time of 3.5 seconds. It's also got better optimal range, but a shorter accuracy fall off, kind of like using auto cannons, but in reverse, if that makes sense. And we've got a much faster explosion velocity and a considerably smaller explosion radius here on the Gram. Basically what this means is that the Gram is better at hitting faster moving small targets, but it does less damage, whereas the Ein Hergi does a lot more damage, but it's better at hitting slower, larger targets. Basically you use the light version of your fighters for these the sort of the faster um, and smaller targets, and then you have the higher DPS version, which is going to be used against cruisers, battle cruisers, and battleships. Um, so you have that variety there. Plus, of course, you can choose which type of fighter squadron you want to launch based on your target. If you're going up against an armor tank, then using explosive or kinetic is going to be better, um, whereas thermal and electromagnetic obviously apply their damage better against shields, which typically have lower resistances to those damage types. There are also two capital ship sized modules that are used almost exclusively on carriers. I say almost exclusively, no, they are used entirely on carriers. There is no point fitting them to anything else. Now ignore the rest of this fit. This isn't a serious suggestion for a fit. This is just me messing around with different things on Fulmination to test carriers out. Now the first of these modules is a fighter fire control array. Now there's nothing here that explicitly states you can't fit this to other ships. It doesn't even have the whole capital ship license of one. However, it does have a ridiculous power grid requirement of 35,724, so good luck fitting it to anything smaller than a capital ship, and it also only affects fighter squadrons, so why the heck would you even want to fit it to anything else? Anyway, what this does is when you activate it, it's a typical weapon upgrade module, when you activate it, for 30 seconds, your fighter squadrons each get a damage bonus increase of 17.45%, and they get an activation time adjustment of minus 7.27%, so the weapons deal more damage and fire more frequently. Notably, unlike other weapon upgrade modules, for example a magnetic field stabilizer or a drone damage amplifier, these do not have a passive effect. These only work when they are activated. The other capital ship sized module for carriers is the Fighter Micro Warp Drive Guide. Now what this essentially does is, well, it's what it, it says on the tin. It basically activates your fighter squadron's micro warp drives. When you activate this, for 20 seconds, all of your deployed fighter squadrons have a flight velocity adjustment of 528%, but a signature radius adjustment of 500%. So they move a lot quicker, they can close the gap between themselves and their target a lot faster, but they are also 500% bigger, making them easier to hit. Again, you could theoretically fit this to other ships, it doesn't have anything stopping you other than a 21,434 megawatt power grid requirement, but it does not affect anything other than carriers um, and their, uh, their, their fighter squadrons. It's worth noting this lasts for 20 seconds, it then has a 60 second reactivation delay. Same with the, uh, the fighter booster, um, that when you activate it, once it comes off its activation, it's 60 seconds again before you can activate it again. 
There are also four rigs specific to fighters squadrons as well, and whilst most of these are fairly self-explanatory, I am going to go through them fairly quickly. Now the first thing you'll notice having a look at any of these rigs is they have the Capital Module License 1 rule, which means they can only be fitted to capital ships, which makes sense because they would do nothing if they were fit to any of the other ships anyway, because they only affect fighters. Now the first two to talk about are the Fighter Firepower Booster, which is kind of like a collision accelerator or a Califaction Catalyst, it just increases the damage of your fighters. There's also the Fighter Burst Aerator, which reduces their activation time. This is like any other burst aerator or a bay loading accelerator. Basically more shots in a shorter period of time, um, meaning more damage there, and firepower just meaning that those shots deal additional damage. Now, the way that this maths out, if you have only one rig slot available, go for the burst aerator. It is a bigger DPS increase. If you want to go for two, due to the stacking penalties, go for a burst aerator and a firepower booster. And if you want to use all three of your rig slots for DPS output, it's going to be two burst aerators and one firepower booster. The third type of rig is a fighter range extender. This increases the accuracy fall off of the weaponry on your fighters. Now considering that most of these weapons are only sort of 10 to 5 kilometers accuracy fall off anyway, I really don't rate this rig all that much. 20% additional uh, accuracy fall off really doesn't do much. It's better than having an empty rig slot, but it's just, it's not at all as useful as any of the others. Although admittedly it is still more useful than the fighter control enhancer, which at the time of me making this video literally does nothing. The description says that it increases the ship's fighter control range, that's already 500 kilometers, and having tested this, no it doesn't. Even if you fit this to a ship, it does not increase the range at which your fighters can engage above 500 kilometers. This rig does nothing. It's worth noting that one of the considerable differences between fighters and drones is that drones you add one per drone tube. Fighters, however, you have to assign them as squadrons. Here you can see I have three Mark IX Ein Herji, and I can add these one by one to each of the individual drone tubes here. You can see there we are, there it goes into the first fighter bay, and I can launch another one into the second there. You'll notice, however, these are one out of nine, which means they're not going to be very effective on their own. What I really need to do is take another one and stack it on top of the previous here. So I can tap this and put it onto one of the ones already in the tubes. This means that where it says two out of nine, I can now take this all the way up to nine out of nine on each of these. The gram, however, if I were to add one of these into a launch tube, you'll notice that this one can go all the way up to 12. There are different fighter uh, squadron sizes depending on the individual fighters, so make sure you're not just adding three fighters to a ship that can theoretically take as many as 36. The final thing then to talk about in regards to carriers is their special activatable mode. Like Dreadnoughts have Showdown mode, Snipers have Sniper mode, and the Striker Battleships have Siege mode, uh, the carriers have their own activatable mode here on the right hand side. It looks like a shield with a little triangle in it. And tapping this will allow you to activate what is called Networked Sensor Mode. This has a 120 second cooldown before you can switch it off again, and it does two things. The first thing it does is increase your scan resolution by a whopping 500%. The second thing it does is make it impossible for you to warp. Now an additional side effect of the inability to warp is the inability to dock. Even though I'm here right next to the station, you'll see if I try to dock with this mode, it'll say it cannot dock under current mode, and I'll have to wait for that to cool down, turn it off, and then I can dock. But the bonus of that is that that 75mm scan resolution that we were looking at earlier has now shot all the way up to 585mm, again thanks to me having targeting skills as well. That is a massive difference. It's the dis difference. It's literally the, the difference between taking 10-15 seconds to lock onto something and only 3 seconds. You can lock on a lot faster, start applying your damage sooner, the only downside is that you cannot warp away to safety until you can switch that mode off so it's well worth doing as soon as possible having it off cooldown so that you can get rid of it and jump away to safety should you need to and yes that does also affect jump drives 
anyway, folks, that's everything I want to talk to you about today in regards to carriers. I hope this has been useful, and I do wish you all the best of luck if you're entering the competition for any of those codes for the Interstellar Bazaar. If you've got to this point in the video and you haven't heard that bit, I do recommend you scrub back through the video and find the bit where I talk about how to earn those discount codes. Some of them are on Twitter, some of them are on Discord, the others are going to be done in the comment section right on this very video. So good luck to you all. I'll be back here in 24 hours to announce the winners, um, so make sure you are keeping your notifications on for YouTube, and um, make sure you have all notifications on that bell so that when I reply, you do get it immediately and other people don't come in and swoop that code away from you. Anyway, best of luck. Let me know how you're getting on with carriers in general. Would love to hear if anyone are piloting these things. Otherwise, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.